containers of the Kubernetes project put out. And in 122, there is going to be deprecation of some of the V1 beta 1 API versions in your YAML. Um, so just keep that in mind for custom resource definitions, webhooks, you're going to have to start using the V1 API. Um, so that's just something to start planning for if you are leveraging, uh, you know, the older paradigms. Um, it has been like there has been a deprecation notice on this for a while. So I think they're finally kind of implementing that. And thanks, Dave, for finally recording. Uh, my moment in the sun will be this next slide. <laughs> Uh, so ecosystem updates, I uh, just want to call out a couple here. So uh, sorry for the blurry picture. I, I thought it wasn't blurry at the time, but I think I probably moved it around a little bit. Um, but this is actually really cool. I saw this on Twitter, uh, but essentially Cilium put out this really cool Kubernetes network policy editor. So it basically visualizes network policies. Um, and and it, it's actually really cool. They come out, came out with a few exercises for basically like a lot of common mistakes that people make when implementing network policy in Kubernetes. Um, and then they have like a, a neat visualization that you can use to essentially see how some of your policies actually work together. And um, so, yeah, I would just recommend going and playing with that. I know I personally am going to uh, just to see kind of how it works. There is an open and free version for you to use, and you don't necessarily have to be using like Cilium network policies in order to be able to, to leverage the tool. And then a few other uh, updates. Some of these came from a, from another one of my teammates, Alice. Um, but Cube Edge being like one of the most popular and kind of favorited open source projects of 2020. Uh, so this is a cool article if you're thinking about running Kubernetes at the edge. Um, you know, essentially this is a really lightweight, compliant Kubernetes distribution that allows you to run Kubernetes in a streamlined way uh, for IoT devices on the edge. Uh, and it is also an incubating project. So I think it was adopt, uh, ad adopted into the uh, um cncf in like 2019 or so and this september in 2020 it went from uh, from sandbox to incubating and then the cloud native computing foundation also put out this really neat kind of predictions for cloud native trends in 2021 and i know that half of our you know half if not most of our jobs depend on maintaining a level of visibility into what's coming next and sometimes it's like moving at lightning speed these days and there's a lot to keep up with um, but i think they did a really good job hitting on a lot of what we see from a customer perspective as well so things like you know cloud native uh, development environments things like code spaces which uh, github code spaces if you're not familiar it's a beta feature now uh, for hosting basically a, a development environment um, and it's really neat so definitely recommend checking that out but seeing that pick up traction especially as as code spaces moves into a more mature uh, stage and then things like cloud native like you know bringing in web assembly into the picture um, things like FinOps I actually hadn't heard of FinOps before but you know it's kind of bringing in the idea of managing costs especially when it comes to Kubernetes like if you want to do chargeback and you're using a multi-tenant cluster or you know multiple teams are sharing a, sing a single cluster uh, things like cube costs that are really truly incubating truly beta um, but still kind of trying to break into that space and make cost management and optimization uh, a bit easier. Uh, also talking about things like cross cloud and even like service catalogs, which I think is really cool how many companies, things like, you know, companies like Lyft that have basically created these incredible like cloud native dashboards for uh, provisioning and running a, a bunch of different kind of workflows. And yeah, definitely we'll share the, uh, the, the slides. All the slides go up on the GitHub page. I think we've been more intentional about slides even than and in some of the recordings as quickly. So yeah, I'll definitely make sure um, that at the end of, actually when I upload the slides, I'll just paste it into the Teams channel as well. Um, so definitely we'll, we'll get better about making sure y'all have that, uh, that as soon as possible. So just, yeah, check this stuff out. Uh, a couple other things. OpenAI actually put out a pretty uh, descriptive article about how they ran a Kubernetes cluster with 7,500 uh, nodes, which seems absolutely insane to me. Uh, and so they just talk about like basically running these large, you know, language models and things like that, and, and some of the things that they had to take into account when they uh, when they were reaching that kind of scale. And then a couple more here, uh, Cube Linter. So basically, this is just a neat open source project that essentially. Uh, yeah, I will put those links in uh, instead of hyperlinking. I will do that. Um, and I'll actually put them in, the, yeah, in the GitHub repo. I'll start linking them directly to the hyperlink section um, at the end of each session. So thanks for the recommendation, Ryan. Uh, but yeah, so Kubelinter is basically just going through and doing static analysis of things like your Helm charts. Uh, so I, I definitely recommend this when it comes to things like DevOps. You know, we're always thinking about infra as code and all these other things. Um, but just want us to take into consideration the fact that as we move and pivot towards things like 
uh, Kubernetes that there have to be ways that we're actually validating our, uh, you know, our Helm charts, our YAML, things like that. So this is definitely a project to look into if you're trying to think about how you can make your DevOps process a bit more uh, secure and Kubernetes aware. And then I also threw a link in here. Um, if y'all have ever looked at the cloud native like CNCF landscape, that's now egregious in, in, in the sense of like it has so many projects on it that it's almost impossible to even know what's going on on it. Um, this is actually a really neat article that somebody went through and they picked each, I guess, I want to say category within the landscape and they broke it down and kind of explained its significance, its relevance, some of the technical underpinnings. And so just if you want to have a better grasp in general on kind of the way that the CNCF structures that landscape and dashboard and some of the different uh, projects that are within that. Um, this is a pretty, uh, pretty good extensive breakdown of that. So that's what I have for us today. I'll go ahead and caveat because I know Strable and I know how how much he loves service meshes and talking about them. Um, but yeah, this is this is gonna we're gonna have him come in hot and he's gonna give some opinions. So just keep that in mind. This is really meant to be a discussion. Um, I think he's probably gonna be pretty honest with you about some things. Um, and I do also want to caveat, and this is just me saying this. Um, Especially when we talk about open open service mesh, there is a lot that's happening in this space internally at Microsoft, just decisions that are being made, roadmap, that kind of thing. So there may be questions that like we just can't answer for you. And that's not because we're, you know, trying to withhold information. It's just that's that's all ongoing. And so, you know, as that continues to progress, um, I'm sure we'll bring in somebody from the from the uh, the team to talk more in depth about those things once they've been solidified. So that's just more, you know, me speaking. Um, but I'll pass it over to Dave now. All right. There we go. Uh, so this is really more informal. Uh, I know on a lot of our previous calls, we've had uh, kind of more formal presentations on a very uh, specific topic and ran through that topic uh, and didn't have a lot, always a lot of time for discussion here. Uh, so really what I put together today is more to kind of spur the discussion. Uh, I know service mesh is a very hot topic. Uh, there's a lot of confusion in the space. Uh, so what I'll do is kind of cover off on what is a service mesh? Do you really need a service mesh? Uh, all these things, I may give opinions, but that doesn't really mean much. Uh, uh, you're, it's very much use case based on whether you really need a service mesh and where you're kind of in your journey of uh, adopting uh, cloud native. Uh, and then I will do a demo of my favorite service mesh. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what that is yet, though. Uh, so what is a service mesh? Uh, this is directly taken from William Morgan, a blog that he wrote on Linkerd. Uh, a service mesh is a tool for adding observability, security, and reliability features to applications by inserting these features at the platform layer rather than the application layer. Uh, so essentially we're taking a lot of these things that we would have to write in like utility code uh, in our applications and moving these to the actual platform layer. Uh, so, you know, we can take that part of that cognitive load off developers. Uh, we can, uh, you know, more seamlessly add these type of features to the platform uh, instead of, you know, uh, different application teams having to come up with new ways to solve for these uh, type features. Uh, if you kind of look at the rise of service mesh, the rise of service mesh sounds uh, so scary, but the rise of really the service mesh, you, you could say it's tied to uh, you know, cloud native, I would say cloud native means so many different things anymore. Uh, it doesn't really have a definition anymore, I'd say. Uh, but when we look at microservices, uh, it, it really changed how we needed to think of things of uh, basic things like security, how we do uh, things like mutual TLS, uh, how we're going to be uh, doing observability because you may have now services that contain uh, a very dynamic environment where you have these services that have maybe uh, thousands of replicas. You have a application that may consist of, you know, 30, 50, 100, or I think it was maybe Uber that was like a thousand uh, services 
uh, that they had. I believe they're bringing that back because they went crazy with microservices. Uh, but a lot of these concerns that came with microservices and a lot of the difficulties with microservices uh, has really made the topic of service mesh popular uh, and really an interesting topic in what it solves. Uh, what I've seen with service mesh when you talk about it, it, it depends on how old you are. Uh, a lot of people will be like, oh, service mesh, that's just mm -hmm. like an enterprise service bus. Uh, uh, I, I would say it's a little different than that, uh, but I always see like this age gap where uh, it, people will relate the service mesh to the enterprise service bus. Uh, so um, the term, I guess you could say William Morgan, uh, term or coin this as service mesh. Uh, I think they service mesh has really been around uh, for a while in some form or fashion. Uh, but if you look back like 2017, I believe 2017 was kind of when Istio uh, was announced, uh, probably at like a KubeCon. Uh, and it was a very interesting technology, especially when you saw a demo of it. It just came off as like this amazing tool that did everything and you really wanted that like satisfaction of going to deploy it. Uh, that's one thing you find in the kind of Kubernetes cloud native space that things are very easy to get started with and get deployed. Uh, but it's what comes after that, you know, what comes at day 30? What comes in to production? Do I really need, uh, you know, to add this layer of uh, abstraction complexity to my environment? Uh, is it worth the trade-off? So let's try to answer some of that. Oh, I had another slide in here. Uh, first, if you look at kind of a service mesh architecture, essentially what it does, it typically the service mesh has a control plane. It will inject, it injects and configures these proxies in front of our application. So if I deploy my front end, my back end, uh, all those and all of its replicas will get injected with this proxy sidecar that will handle things like, uh, you know, MTLS uh, between service to service. It also has a lot of visibility uh, into the different traffic between service to service, can handle things like traffic management. So when do you need a service mesh? Uh, so I would say some things that uh, you should really think about when considering a service mesh. Uh, I should probably put another title in here, but uh, is these are things I, I see that when you may not need to rush out to, you know, go deploy a service mesh and get in production. Uh, when you, all your microservices are written in one language, uh, that becomes much easier because when I have to solve for like, you know, certificate rotation or MTLS between service to service, uh, you know, things like uh, specific tooling, like instrumentation, that that's a lot easier when it's, you know, a single language uh, that you're using for your microservices. Uh, if you, I, I would definitely say there is some advantages if you have a monolithic architecture that you can still get out of service mesh, uh, but those are less like when you actually have like a microservice architecture and you have all these service to service type calls where you have to worry about, uh, especially the observability piece. I think that's one thing people like microservices sound great, but there's this huge gap in observability that uh, a lot of us don't have uh, and are not ready for uh, to, you know, to be able to reason with our systems. Uh, you know, if you are release when you release an application, re you're releasing all at once. Uh, you know, you can't release one service at a time. Those type of things, you should probably think about the the service mesh is something you probably don't have to solve for today. Uh, it may be something you investigate. Uh, again, these are just opinions. It's going to be use case specific on your environment, but these are some things you, you really should think of. Uh, when it may be more urgent to solve and put a service mesh in, in place is when you you have microservices that are written in you know multiple different languages. Maybe that's .NET, Java, Ruby, Python, Go, Rust. Uh, I think I solved all the ones people use today. Maybe Erlang. Uh, but when you have a you know, an environment with polyglot languages, 
uh, you're you have teams that are solving for these things like how do I do you know uh, cert certificates MTLS between these different services they're maintaining their own libraries uh, they're writing a lot of utility code for cert rotation uh, so it makes a lot of sense with the service mesh is now I can just provide that at the platform layer then rather solving it and maintaining those libraries for all these different languages and having my developers writing all this utility code. Uh, I like using the cert rotation one because I think everybody uh, has ran into that uh, and it's not fun to just deal with certificate rotation if I could get that out of the box with something like service mesh. Um, when you have stringent security needs. That's one that I see a lot of times people start with is, hey, I need MTLS between service to service. Uh, service Mesh does a great job of that, and it's something that comes out of the box. Uh, you will see that when I do a demo. Um, other times when your teams, you know, are spending a lot more time trying to understand their system rather than, you know, actually fixing the system. Uh, that kind of falls into the observability, having observability across boundaries uh, in those different hybrid environments. These are all things to really think of that may cause more of a urgency to, you know, at least start exploring a service mesh and how that would fit in your environment. Ah, the service mesh landscape. Okay, so uh, the service, I couldn't fit all the logos out there in this space. Uh, like I said, it is a very hot space. Uh, there's probably another 10 in here that you could fit in here. Uh, a lot of service meshes out there, there's a lot based on Istio. Uh, we see Linkerd in our customers a lot. Uh, Kuma is a newer one that was donated to the CNCF. Uh, and HashiCorp console uh, came from kind of the service discovery world. Uh, and is now has service mesh features here. Uh, so there's tons of them you can evaluate out there, but I'm going to cover kind of uh, the top three that we typically see implemented in uh, customers today. Uh, there are probably the most mature uh, service meshes today. Uh, I like to call Linkerd their original service mesh, uh, as they had this product called Linkerd V1, uh, that had some of these service mesh type features, but it was uh, implemented in a different way. It was, Java, it was a JVM based uh, implementation, which is not good to have to, you know, throw in a JVM, a proxy based on the JVM into every single replica you had. Uh, so when they moved to Linkerd v2, uh, which was more purpose built for a service mesh, uh, and the reason I say purpose built with Linkerd is because they did write their own proxy. A lot of the other service meshes will use the Envoy proxy. Uh, Linkerd had very good reasons why they wanted to build their own proxy. It's written in Rust, it's super fast. They're really optimizing for the use case. Uh, the one thing I like about Linkerd, it's very lightweight. They have a very, they focused a lot on the user experience. Uh, of getting those kind of key features and solving for the 80% uh, and not the 100% uh, and keeping it a, a very reasonable and a service mesh that you can easily reason with. Uh, I would say they're kind of maybe, if you had to look at like their maybe pitfalls would be that it's very Kubernetes only. It's really only focused on Kubernetes uh, from a, a service mesh. Uh, they're multi-cluster. They do have some new multi-cluster features. It's not all that mature. Uh, I can't say I have a strong opinion on that. I just haven't played, used it enough. Uh, but they do some trickery with uh, service mirroring uh, and ingresses and that. But uh, that's something also just to consider. Uh, Istio. Istio is probably the most marketed one. Uh, you can't go to a KubeCon without seeing 50 Istio presentations, it would lead you to believe that everybody's using Istio, but in reality, uh, most people are playing with Istio uh, rather than running in production. And that's not to say nobody's running in production. There are some big customers uh, that I think are very public about their use of Istio. I would say Walmart uh, being one that is also a customer that runs Istio and AKS. Uh, so there definitely are big customers running, 
but it's not uh, the number you would think from the popularity of it. Uh, a lot of Istio is loosely based on Google Tech, kind of like Kubernetes was. I think what that brings to Istio, though, is some complexity uh, because 99% of customers out there don't actually have Google type problems. Uh, so some of their opinions within the technology uh, are solving for the problems they had rather than kind of the typical enterprise customer. Uh, it is super feature rich. Uh, they are trying to solve for the 100% rather than 80%. When you're solving for that 100%, it is going to bring complexity uh, with it. I will say the complexity in Istio is getting much better. They move from a microservice architecture where their control plane had like, you know, five, six different components. Uh, they moved that back into a monolith, which uh, I, I think makes it a little easier to reason with. Uh, when you have to manage Istio. Uh, they've also focused a little more on the user experience of getting of deploying Istio, uh, you know, being able to troubleshoot Istio. Uh, also built on the Envoy proxy. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is HashiCorp console. HashiCorp console has been around for a very long time. Uh, it was initially really a service discovery and distributed key value store. Uh, was kind of its original use cases out there. Uh, so you do see it used already out there in very large environments, very highly scalable, uh, where I think customers look at HashiCorp console as if they already have it implemented or they really need like really rich support for hybrid architectures. And when I say hybrid, I mean things that live maybe within Kubernetes and things that live outside of Kubernetes. Uh, you know, maybe I have a fleet of services uh, that are all based on, you know, deployed on VMs, and I want to actually connect those into my service mesh. Console does a beautiful job of that. Uh, I think where it can lack some is observability features, also getting better in their latest release. Uh, they have a lot more visualizations within their console. Uh, the initial hurdle can be very complex for initial setup and architecture. Uh, you really have to, uh, you know, put some effort into getting it stood up. Once it is stood up and you have a solid architecture for it, uh, it gets easier from a management standpoint. Uh, and they also offer managed services uh, around console. Uh, I think right now Azure and AWS uh, both have managed console. Uh, that you can use, uh, that uh, HashiCorp essentially manages console for you. You say, hey, deploy it to uh, whatever regions you want and very little configuration uh, for that. Uh, an open service mesh, it gets its own slide by itself. Uh, really, I just can fit it into that slide. Uh, open service mesh is a uh, open source service mesh that was donated to the CNCF by Microsoft. Uh, part of the reason for building open service mesh, uh, a lot of it was uh, to have a CNCF based service mesh um, that was really focused. I think a lot of uh, you could probably look at it and say a lot of uh, the features and its principles came from something like Linkerd. Uh, the reason I say that is because it's very focused on the user experience and only solving for like that 80%. It's not going to have, uh, you know, 100% of the features that maybe SDO might have. Uh, but it is very focused on uh, providing a simple way to get started uh, with Service Mesh with those key capabilities around, you know, uh, mutual TLS, access control policies for, uh, you know, having fine grained uh, policies of controlling traffic uh, and then also that kind of deep the observability for debugging and monitoring certificate management and traffic shifting. Uh, those are typically the key features you people are or customers are wanting to look out for from a service mesh. Uh, it also utilizes the Envoy proxy. Uh, you'll see I have a work in progress here. The, I say that because it's only at uh, it hasn't hit a version 1.0 release yet. It's not something you want to go today and deploy into your production environment. 
Uh, I take no responsibility if you do that. It is something I would definitely look at, uh, especially in AKS, open service mesh will kind of be what we will provide as a add-on. Uh, if you look in AKS, like the different add-ons around monitoring, those type of tools, uh, open service mesh will be one of those. Uh, there should be a public, there should be a preview coming for from for this uh, in the very near future. So if you are inter, if you are a customer uh, working in AKS and interested in open service mesh as a AKS add-on, uh, you can feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and we can get you in uh, connection with the product group for that. So you're probably thinking right now that I'm going to do a open service mesh demo, but I am not. Because it has not reached my favorite service mesh yet. Uh, and being from Microsoft, I thought there's plenty of videos out there, so I would try something uh, a little off the cuff that I didn't prepare for on purpose. Uh, I prepared a little, but uh, if I could get my teams to work here. Okay, let me share. I'll share my entire desktop to make this easier, even though that's like a huge no-no. Uh, since we're recording this, we'll just cut those parts out if I show anything I shouldn't have. All uh, right, all right, all right. So I have a cluster here. We're gonna say, okay, get. Let's show you. It's like actually a real cluster. Can you see my screen? I should have made sure of that first. I can see yep, it. I can see it. All right, all right. Uh, is it large enough? No. no. Okay, let's try this. Or is that worse? We'll enlarge it a little. Much better. Much better. Okay. Uh, so essentially, I have an AKS cluster here. Uh, you'll see if I get the namespaces. I have a few namespaces here uh, of different things I'm running in this. Oh, I actually have Istio in here too. Uh, that I did not realize, but I am going to demo Linkerd here. Uh, because I think it shows a lot of uh, a lot of the value you can get out of service mesh. And like I said, I didn't really prepare for this. I copied a couple of their uh, one-liners here, uh, so you don't have to see me fumble around uh, and mistype these. Uh, but very easy to get started with. So Linkerd, I already installed it, so you don't have to wait for the install, even though it takes like 60 seconds to install. One of the things Linkerd has is it. Ah, OK, I reinstalled this here, so. OK, so I already have Linkerd installed, so I will just show you some of the things that it has installed. Um, OK, so in here, when I installed, I did just the default install. It installed a few different uh, components here. So the Linkerd controller, so that's going to do things like, uh, you know, configure my certs and that, hand those out, configure the proxies. Uh, I also have a identity, so that's going to provide identity to uh, our different applications that we have part of this service mesh. Uh, some of the other tools, like you'll see Linkerd tap here. Uh, the Linkerd tap. Uh, this one is, it gives you a little more fine grained, like actual like route metrics in that, that I will show. And then it also has some stuff, Prometheus and Grafana that it's deployed and also a dashboard. So the first thing I'm going to do is just deploy this fun little emoji vote, uh, application. So it goes through, it's just creating this namespace, couple different deployments. Uh, essentially, it's going. It's a voting website. It's got a web front end. Uh, it's got a load generator in here. Uh, and that's that vote bot here. Um, 
And then we're going to take a look. At the dashboard, uh, this is also one of my favorite things within here is that it actually has a dashboard. This is what happens with live demos, they always go wrong. There we go. Uh, maybe it's just from here. OK. Awesome. So we have we should have a namespace now for our, our emoji voto here. We're going to look at our deployments. OK, so within our deployments, uh, you can see the deployments we have. You will see here that I actually don't do not have these part of the service mesh. Uh, with Linkerd, you can have it automatically inject essentially you can set to automatically inject a proxy, or you could do it manually. Uh, so if you had existing services in your cluster, uh, you could then inject them. If you wanted all your services, anytime they get deployed to your Kubernetes cluster, you could set auto inject there too. All right, so now that I have a application deployed, we are going to bring up that application. I have way too many port forwards going on here. All right, so here is our application. We're going to click some of these. Uh, we're going to pick a donut. Uh oh, so our application is broken. Uh, so we don't know why really here. So we are going to show the power of Linkerd here. And essentially all this command is doing here is doing this Linkerd inject. Uh, so it's going to uh, inject that deployment. So it does get a the actual uh, Linkerd proxies injected into it. All right, so now we injected our deployments. Linkerd also has these nice little U, these CLI tools where you can do like these easy checks on uh, to make sure the proxy is working. So you can see here it's waiting for the check to complete. Uh, that is because it is starting that proxy up. And you'll see now that has completed here. So now that we do have uh, that application as part of our mesh. Uh, the nice thing here, you can also, we'll say, go into this web. Uh, it gives you a nice little layout of how these services are dependent uh, and also their uh, live calls that you have within here. So you can see two from uh, those type of calls within here. Uh, on here, we can also go down here and see that all of our uh, Every different service, the service call here is secured with MTLS. Uh, we can also go, you know, jump down into uh, more specifics around a, the different live calls here. They also have a tool called TAP uh, that when you play around with it, you definitely want to check out. Uh, but it gives you, you can start like actually filtering on these uh, actual calls here. Uh, you know, I could filter down to the exact HTTP method, you know, the maximum uh, request per second. Uh, so it gives us a lot of information in here. So you can see here that the web is actually broken. Uh, well, the web is what it's actually calling is broken. We can see down here from the vote bot, uh, you can see, oh, we have 0% success to that vote donut. Uh, so that's where the observability piece comes into service mesh of giving us those fine grained like information about the live calls happening from service to service within here. From the traffic splits in here, you'll see I have no traffic splitting currently. 
one of the things we are going to do here is actually go in. This is a, even a lot more fun demo here is we're going to use a tool called flagger. Essentially flagger is going to let me um, do canary de like automated canary deployments. And it's going to let me set a very specific like uh, specific rules of how that traffic starts shifting over. Uh, so here, all we're doing here is ooh, another port forward. Okay. Uh, let me do this port forward. All right. So now we have this port forward. We'll bring up this application. Uh, all right. So you can see our basic application here. We're going to use Flagger here. Flagger, essentially what we're going to do is say what deployment we're targeting. We're targeting this pod info app we have over here. The analysis it's going to do, it's going to do it every 10 seconds. Um, it's going to, the weight's going to shift up to 10% each time. So I may, I'm going to start at say 90% is going to go to version one, 10% is going to go to version two. As these metrics, my success rate keeps going up and up and up, it's going to keep shifting traffic over by 10% automatically uh, based on these two metrics, re uh, the request rate and the request duration. Uh, so as long as it's below 500 milliseconds and that we are, you know, having a or returning 200s, it's going to start shifting that traffic. All right, so. We'll see if that actually worked. All right. So we'll see if that flagger command worked because it actually got cut off pretty bad here. All right, so it is creating its canary deployment. Uh, that's why we see the rollout to of zero to one. All right, so it's canary deployment for that pod info app has started to sync. Right, if we go back to linker D here, we should see and where our deployments. Oh, test namespace here. Uh, so we have pod info and pod info primary. Uh, so we have a canary deployment on here. As you can see, we have a specific success rate here of 100%. Uh, request per second. If we keep hitting this, I believe let's we could make this go faster with. I think it's in the docs here. Sorry. There's one command I did not have in here for it. Is this one right here? Okay, so we're just going to create a uh, update the image where the image we're using is 1.7.0. We're going to update that image to 1.7.1. Uh, so now when we hit this, it should, we'll just start generating more traffic for it. All right, so you can see our traffic now is split between 90 and 10%. Uh, as I keep generating more traffic here, we should start seeing a different background come up here. Okay, so 20% is going there now. All oh, right, we generated some more. So 30% uh, of traffic is going to our canary, or 40% is going to our canary release now. 
and 60 per, only 60 percent is going to that pod info primary uh, so essentially this showcased how you can use traffic splits you don't have to use it with flagger and automate it like that uh, i just think that's like super cool that you can like automate it based on certain metrics to actually shift that traffic over uh, and a really cool feature and flagger works with a lot of the other service messages also and i will stop there because i know i totally went over uh on time i wanted to so i will stop there uh and allow time for discussion questions I see a comment on Caddyshack, one of my favorite movies. So I had a question actually on the comparison earlier. Oh, hold on. Yeah, sure. Um, you called out that Istio, I think, was expanding or working on the multi mesh. Can you kind of explain that a little bit? Oh, which one for Istio? Yeah, if you go back to your comparison slide. Yeah, they, so back. they have a they have that today. Uh, so you can do different type of architectures where you can have multi cluster control planes or a single control plane and connect multiple Kubernetes clusters into your service mesh. So I can get things like MTLS from uh, a service in cluster A to a service B in cluster B. Uh, they also have kind of that hybrid too, where you can actually install Istio on a, say, VM uh, and bring those services into uh, the service mesh. Gotcha. And does that still require you to configure ingress and egress on each one of the clusters, like each cluster having its individual control plane, or do they centralize that at a single control plane at a higher level? You can do it both ways. Uh, you will have to do, that's where I think the Istio, like the multi-cluster setup for Istio is uh, pretty complex. Uh, there is a, the you will have to configure things like the ingress gateway that Istio provides in that. Yeah. Did you evaluate Kong at all by chance? Just curious. Kong mesh and Kong uh, gateway. I have not. I've deployed it, but uh, uh, I've kind of, uh, I will probably say spent most of my time with Linkerd and Istio. Got it. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Uh, and maybe at some point uh, we show Istio. Uh, I I would I I always recommend every customer starting to look at uh, you know things like service mesh is to go out there and look at because uh, they all have their different value. Uh, but for majority of customers, especially if you're newish to Kubernetes within like the last year, you're still learning how to run your, you know, services like well on Kubernetes. Uh, Linkerd, in my opinion, is just something very easy to get started with uh, and is a very mature product at this point. Uh, like I mentioned, I did mention our open service mesh. It's something we're working on. Uh, but again, it's been out there for, I guess, maybe six months. Uh, but it has, it took some of the same principles that uh, Linkerd uh, had with ease of use, a user experience, those type of things. Uh, so definitely always evaluate what's out there and not go with what you see most at KubeCon. Because uh, I did that one time in my life too. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and it can bite you, uh, kind of following what is most talked about and marketed out there. And while I, I see we have William Morgan actually joined our call, uh, and he did not pay me for this segment at all. All right, any other questions out there? Uh, so there's contact enroll on open service mesh trial um so if you're a customer that's on aks and you're interested you can email uh just email dave or i and we'll we'll see if there's something we can do to help there um i just saw that in the chat
We should have had a survey at the beginning that asked how many people were using a service mesh and or how many people started using Istio and then thought maybe it added too much complexity. Like there's there's just all so many questions I have. Um, it does look like somebody has their hand raised though. Hi, um, Paul here. We're a, an avid user of AKS in Azure, and we've we've undertaken some deep analysis to understand if we we do actually need a service mesh. And um, it's one of the first places I've worked <laughs> where we do need one. Um, very heavy uh, microservice API architecture. Um, we're, we're going to perform our own analysis, as as you've just suggested. Um, we're looking to, to get on to open service mesh trial, so that that will be helpful. Um, my main question would be around what approach would you take to roll out a service mesh? So we've already got existing um, architecture there. Would you rebuild or would you try to integrate in an existing environment? Yeah, I think the most important thing there when trying to roll out a service mesh is make sure you kind of approach it iteratively, meaning that you may maybe MTLS is going to provide a huge amount of value to you. So to start there. Uh, you don't have to roll out every single feature a service mesh provides day one. Uh, something like MTLS gets a lot of people pretty far. Uh, and what they actually want out of a service mesh. So if that is it, start there and get comfortable with like actually managing a service mesh in your environment. Uh, a lot of times we see people go in and they want to take on, you know, you know, all these different features a service mesh provides, uh, but the complexity is just too much and they don't really understand. Uh, like service, you have to be very comfortable with like troubleshooting it, your whatever your service mesh of choice is. Uh, each one provides you know tooling around that, but you have to be very comfortable because this is something you're you know throwing into your data plane. Uh, so it's it's not like a monitoring tool where yeah it's bad if it goes down, but this is really bad if you can't you know manage and troubleshoot it. Uh, so take uh, more of that slow approach. Uh, and I would love to hear any others that maybe implement service mesh or have opinions here. Yeah, I would say a couple of things that I would I would recommend as criteria is whether or not you need to separate the responsibility of the data plane and the control plane. So if you have a security group that's going to administer the control plane and you have the developers administering the data plane, then you know, that's one consideration of how you would implement it and where you would implement it. And then the other thing uh, to the current, to the existing versus new infrastructure, I know for the Envoy sidecar based um, service mesh solutions, they're generally uh, sidecar solutions that require an annotation in the YAML. So you can deploy the components to that cluster as long as you have the resources to run it. And you're only enabling it on workloads if you annotate them accordingly. So you can have it like deployed, but not necessarily enabled on all of your workloads. And then you can slow roll that one. Brilliant. Thanks, Jens.